here in the House of Lords. Um, and I also chair uh, an all-party parliamentary group, um, the APBG for Agriculture and Food for Development, which believes that um, agriculture, promotion of smallholder agriculture, um, will is one of the best tools for development in, in, in developing countries that there is. And partly because it, it obviously helps a sustainable supply of nutrition for um, both rural people and urban people, uh, but also because it, it, it's being produced in your own country and it, and it, and it uh, kickstarts the rural economy in a way that probably no other form of um, aid and development can. So that's what we believe we try to promote that politically. Now, um, I'm also incidentally a farmer. Um, and um, I used to think as a farmer that, uh, that the, the whole food chain went from plough to plate. Okay, but I now know differently because actually it goes from soil to stomach, which is a little widely bit racking <clears throat> And um, and uh, the soil, as I'm sure you all know, has a million different bacteria. One teaspoonful of soil contains one billion bacteria, of which there are probably a million different sorts of bacteria. And that feeds through all the way to the stomach, where there are another infinite number of bacteria using the, that fuel to produce energy and, and, and hopefully um, a, a, a lifestyle. So um, it's, it's good that we're not only focusing on fuel for cars, and now we're beginning to focus on diesel and the, and the, um, and the, and the health hazards in diesel. But we're also, I'm very glad to say, focusing more on the fuel for human beings, nutrition. I mean, I do quite a lot of work for the government in terms of science research, and um, the, the, the agricultural scientists and now looking more and more at nutrition per hectare as opposed to tons per hectare. Because it's all very well producing 10 tons per hectare of wheat, but actually if the wheat isn't particularly beneficial as a nutritional source, source of fuel, then it's, uh, it's not quite so, 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 so good. And actually I think if more money was put into things other than the staple diets of wheat, rice and, and uh, maize, we probably get better nutrition all around the world, but that's another, another subject. So today's, um, to this, tonight's this evening's meeting is all about fuel, fuel for human beings, to, to ensure that every human being in hopefully every country can um, live a full life and contribute to their society, wherever they might be, uh, which is, a, and it's not only in developing countries, obviously it's in the UK as well. So that's the end of my particular bit of introduction. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce all the speakers, and, and, and so we don't have to re redo it and, um, when, when we come to each individual one. And, um, and then we'll go into Karina Hawkes' keynote speech. Professor Karina Hawkes, who's the first one, is Director of Food Policy at City University of London and has published widely on food policy and on policies and processes of globalisation, trade policy, agricultural policy, nutritional labelling, and policies on food marketing to children. She also has diverse national and international experience, <coughs> including a fellowship at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And our next most important guest is Dr. Renato Malouf, who is an um, Associate Professor of Agriculture, Development and Society at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro, and has just finished actually a stint working with Korea at the City University. Um, uh, Renato is the author of several books and scientific articles. He's an expert on agriculture, food and nutrition policies, uh, is a member of the National Board of the Brazilian Network on Food, Nutrition, Sovereignty and Security. He's also a member of and former president of the National Council of Food and Nutritional Security, CEF, that serves as the key advisory board to the president of Brazil. <coughs> Lord Watts, to my right here, was a Labour MP for St. Helens North from 1997 to 2015 and chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party between 2012 and 2015. Formerly a shop steward at United Biscuits Factory in Liverpool, and he's now a Labour peer, and is also chair of the British Brazilian APPG, whose purpose is obviously to maintain parliamentary contacts and other contacts between the UK and Brazil. Uh, Maggie Throops, oh Maggie, there he is, is Conservative MP for Erewhon, is that right? Um, and Maggie is a scientist turned businesswoman who has worked in the health sector. And, um, and she has established some chairs, the APPG on Adult and Childhood Obesity, and was a member of the Health Select Committee. Emma Lula Buck 
is Labour MP for South Shields um, and has um, campaigned on a number of issues, um, including uh, action for the cost of living crisis. Um, Emma is Vice Chair of the APPG of Hunger and Food Poverty and has consistently put pressure on the government in addressing the growing levels of hunger in the UK, including holiday hunger of school children suffering from problems during the holidays. And last but not least, we have Anna Taylor, who is the Executive Director of the Food Foundation, who is actually hosting this event, really. Um, an independent think tank that tackles the growing challenges facing the UK's food system. Um, uh, through the interest of the UK public. And previously, Anna has worked in the Department of International Development, where she led the policy team on nutrition and supported the delivery of the UK's global commitments to tackle hunger and nutrition. So those are all the, all the kind of speakers at the head table. But I'm hoping we'll give everyone a chance to come in. And when you do come in, um, please obviously introduce yourselves. So without further ado, we're going to go and I'm going to ask Professor Freena Hawkes to give us a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and it's fantastic to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming uh, to this event, and thank you to the Free Foundation for organising it. I, when I was uh, looking at this title earlier, I was reflecting on how uh, depressing it is. It's got problem twice in the title, and uh, poor and mal, as in bad and poor. So it's, uh, I'm hoping that I, it will cheer up as I go, though I will be presenting some somewhat depressing statistics to, to begin with. But the, the purpose of this is, is really to, to think about the British problem of value teaching in the context of the global problem. And one of the things that we do at the Centre for Food Policy, and indeed in my, in my other role as co-chair of the Global Nutrition Report, is to try and think about market nutrition as a global problem. And that, by global, I don't mean it's a problem that just affects the developing world over there and the rich world over here, but it affects all of us and there are various connections between that. And I think that's a very important message for, for what the Food Foundation is, is bringing together with the region. Well. So I just want to start by a very simple understanding of what malnutrition is, and it's simply poor nutrition, that's it. So when I was growing up, the, the vision of malnutrition was of a, frankly, a starving kid on the TV. And, but we now understand malnutrition in a much more comprehensive way, and that it's anything to do with uh, not having the right amount. And this is an NHS definition, it doesn't encompass all aspects of malnutrition, uh, but the outcome is that people are malnourished in a certain respect. And at the Global Nutrition Report, we estimate that at least one in three people in the world have some form of malnutrition. Let me explain that. It's uh, not a great slide for a light room, but uh, what this slide has on it is the different forms of malnutrition, and as you probably can't see the numbers. But we're talking kids not growing properly, we're talking kids who are too thin, we're talking kids who carry excess weight, and adults, we're talking about deficiencies of micronutrients, and we're talking about the diets associated with non physical diseases, <coughs> like related to cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. So that is a lot of different conditions. So you can begin to see why uh, one in three, or probably more than that, people have some form of malnutrition. And when we look at how well the world is doing at addressing malnutrition, we're not doing wonderfully, but we're not doing so bad. In the sense of stunting, if again you can see this, childhood stunting when kids don't grow properly, the number of countries in which childhood stunting is going down, um, there are some countries um, in which childhood stunting is going down and meeting global targets, the set of global targets on nutrition. And there are countries who are set to meet that target. And there are some countries that are set to meet targets on things like cheating and waste meat as well. Where we don't see any pro we don't see enough progress, but where we don't see any progress at all is around obesity and increasing rates. So some good news, 
Um, so progress in some areas, but not fast enough, and overall uh, bad news on the obesity side. So that's the global picture. If we look at the UK, it actually represents this picture, as do many European countries. So we have very, very large rates of overweight and obesity among men, women, and children. But we also have food insecurity. In other words, when people feel at risk of not having enough to eat, not being able to access the healthy diet they want to buy. And in recent years, this phenomenon where more and more families are obtaining, having to go to food banks for food. And then we also have a problem as well among the elderly being malnourished, most of whom live in communities. So what we have then is a picture globally of a combination of feast and famine, to use that rather crude language, and uh, also that inside the UK too. And I, I really must stress that this isn't just a food problem. We all know that um, many of us are familiar with the fact that autumn sanitation, breastfeeding, uh, access to health services, all of these things are incredibly important in nutritional status. But when you look across these different forms of malnutrition, the unifying factor between them is a poor diet. So this slide is showing what the situation is with the global diet. That people are eating too many uh, sugary foods, salty foods, too much meat, and or they're not consuming enough nutrition to fill with whole grains, fruits and vegetables, uh, uh, fish, nuts, and so on. So if you're someone who is malnourished in, say, Malawi, you're not getting enough of the foods on the right. And that's pretty much the same in Britain as well. It's just that the quantity difference, but it's still the same problem. And it's the case as well in, 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 in low-income countries, and low middle income countries, that often people will have very, very starchy diets. They can't hold grain diets, very starchy diets, and then they'll get maybe a little bit more money, and that will go on very, very inexpensive biscuits, for example, as opposed to the more nutritious foods that are available. So this is a unified problem, a unifying cause all around the world. So if you look at diets in the UK, on the left is the Eat Well Guide, which is what we're meant to eat. On the right is what we do eat, with just two highlighted points there, that we're consuming far too many drinks, high in fats and sugars, and far too few fruits and vegetables. And thinking about vegetables, here is some data on vegetables, if you can see this. It stands on the courtesy of the, of the Food Foundation for this slide, uh, that basically 80% of adults and 95% of older children do not eat enough vegetables. And much of what is consumed actually comes from, um, from beans and pizza and other processed foods. So not a great source of, of vegetables, and also the essential economic So it's all getting even more depressing um, that the estimates show, the epidemiology, the analysis that's been done is that globally poor diets are actually the leading cause of ill health today. So dietary risks are at the top. Um, if you can see that, you might not be able to, but also high blood pressure, child malnutrition, undernutrition, that means high body mass index, uh, high fasting cosmic glucose, which is associated with diabetes, and uh, high level of cholesterol uh, all appear in that top 10. So added together, uh, they have a tremendous impact on our health. This is just some other data again to show what the situation is in different countries. You can see that um, the all-important dietary diversity, which is a very important measure, particularly for middle-income countries, of the quality of diets, is very, very low in, in many sub-Saharan African countries. At the same time, in Egypt, that a large proportion of foods eaten by very, very young children are essentially junk foods, and very high proportion of sugar drinks in the US. And then all the analysis that we did with Global Nutrition Report showed, albeit with a huge range, that only 15% of children in lower income countries consume what is defined by the World Health Organization as a minimally acceptable diet. So at this point, um, it's 
It's not looking good. It's not looking good. Where I begin to get really excited about the solutions, about, uh, about the solutions, is when we start to think about this problem in a big context. Because ultimately, what we eat is determined by an interaction of our own individual and household characteristics with what's out there and produced by the food. So what this slide shows is diet quality in the middle, and then characteristics of, of people. In this case, we've just put purchasing power on this slide. This is a, a diagram I developed for a report uh, called the Foresight Report on Food Systems and Diets, published by the Global Panel on Agriculture, Food Systems and Nutrition. And in putting this together, what I was trying to do was to articulate the fact that diets were in the middle, then there were people with their characteristics, how much money we have, how many assets we have, what kind of history we have, what kind of culture we have, and that then interacts with the food environment around people, and then with the broader food system, which I've defined here as agricultural production systems, food storage and transport, food retail, and uh, food transformation in the words food processing, and other interactions as food goes through its system. In other words, everything from soil to stomach, as was said earlier, that is what our food system is. And when we start to think about the food system, the reason it gets so exciting is because there's so many opportunities to intervene. So this is where it gets exciting. You start thinking this big problem, what can we do about it? The opportunity is huge. And first off, though, we need to think about the food environment around the people. So what I'm showing here is just imagine that you're a woman in this case with a couple of kids, and you're going about your day. And you give your kids breakfast in the morning, you have no idea that that bread is a packet of salt. You take your kids to school, this is a multi country photo montage, by the way. Uh, you take your kids to school, this is a photo from Peru. Um, around your school, around your kids' school, is a ton of PR selling um, sugary candy and fish. The kid goes to school, I think this is a photo from Chile, they have some great looking meat and some potato chips. Uh, you then go to the doctor, the doctor knows that your kids have got some problems with their weight, say, doesn't mention it, no, pro no possibility of interacting with the doctor, you then go, I'm sure you probably can't see this, you then go past a fast food place, and the salad is a lot, the water and the salad is a lot more expensive than the potato and the fries, you then go to a supermarket and you're attracted to this healthy looking cereal because it's this all grain in it, even though it's extremely high in sugar. You then get your kids from school, take them home, and they're watching junk food advertising on television. So this is actually quite typical for a Latin American context, I'd say, more of a, a, of a Middle income Western setting. Um, but does it need to actually be that way? We can imagine something different here. We can imagine that the bread is whole grain, and it's healthier. We can imagine that there's fruits and vegetables available rather than candy. We can imagine a lovely nutritious meal. This is from Brazil, by the way. <laughs> we can imagine that when people go and have contact with their health system, that there is support available. We can imagine that the prices switch and it's cheaper to get the healthier option. You can imagine that when foods really shouldn't be on the shelves at all, that was a warning label. And you can imagine that rather than advertising of junk food on television, there is promotion of a healthy lifestyle. It doesn't need to be unhealthy, but it is. There is money to be made from this system. It is economically possible too. You might not believe that, I would get simply too depressed by that. <laughs> Now, you definitely can't see this one. The point I want to make here uh, is that the analysis that I've done, and the, done at the centre as well as some work at the Global Nutrition Report really makes it clear that if you actually look at these particular aspects of food environment, so for example, if you say advertising on television, there's a reason why that happens. It's not just because someone says, um, I'm, I'm going to advertise to kids, I'm going to make money. That is obviously an important reason why people do it, why companies do it. But there's incentives in the system, there's economic incentives in the system, there are technological incentives in the system. 
There are um, uh, relationships around power and governance in the system. There are um, all kinds of incentives that are going much further back into the food system that make marketing of these foods difficult, but the selling of healthier foods on the street, the provision of that delicious looking school meal there, um, making the healthier option the cheaper option. There's all kinds of disincentives that go to that. And that's why we need to go back into the food system to identify the people who are not selling enough nutritious foods and selling too many non-nutritious foods, just say if you to walk down the street in India, for example, and you walk past an instant noodle seller, which India is obsessed with right now, there's a reason why that is happening. And part of that reason um, is because of cultural acceptability, but part of that reason is also because it's been encouraged through marketing, and part of that reason is because of the cost of the ingredients and the trade and the well and refined flour that go into those noodles make it a very profitable product for the company that is doing it. So we need to understand what these incentives and disincentives are in the system. And what I'm showing here is some work that Fiona Watson and I are doing. I'd like to uh, acknowledge Fiona for putting this slide together as part of some work we're doing together at the Centre for Food Policy, is trying to map these incentives and disincentives out. We certainly can't read any of this. It's simply to make a point that when you actually try, this is the case of sugar, that when you actually try to think, why is it that manufacturers, yeah. from domestic manufacturers in Mozambique to manufacturers here in the UK, why are they putting so much sugar in things? It's got to do with consumers. It's got to do with the, fact, with the, the nature of processing. It's got to do with the cost of sugar. It's got to do with the way that sugar is produced. There are lots of different factors that mean that people are not evil who are creating this diet, they're simply responding to assessment incentives. So what we can do is we can start to change the incentives in the whole food system in order to create food environments that are consistent with healthy messaging. So what we have then is lots of potential points for intervention. What's really important here is how you prioritise. There's so many things that we can do in the food system. What do you do? This is the question that I hear all the time. Well, what you do is you start with understanding people's lives. You start with understanding people's experiences. If people are vulnerable and deprived and marginal in some way, how much money they have, uh, how much education they have, what skills they have, what Stoves, uh, stoves they have, what gender relationships they have in the home. These are immensely important. When we're thinking about the external food system, we mustn't forget about these important characteristics and the characteristics of people's home. Whether they have kitchens, do they actually have access to sanitation? We, must, we mustn't forget that many people in low and middle income countries don't have access to toilets, for example. So, this has um, big implications for behaviours in the home, which are very important when they come to uh, food acquisition behaviours. So we've got to think about people's homes. But then we then go back into the system and say, okay, so where do people acquire food? Do they grow it? Do they get it from a supermarket? Do they get it from a street vendor? What are the possibilities for intervening in that part of the system? Then we go out and say, how affording, how available and affordable? So what are the prices? What is the marketing of that? in that setting as well as in other settings. Then you say, what's going on in, in food storage and distribution and trade? For example, food safety is a huge issue in nutrition. Really important issue. We don't tend to talk about it so much on the unhealthy diet, obesity side of things, but in fact, it is important when people are drinking Coca-Cola rather than water because they think um, it is safer, which is what it is. It's, it's, it's important um, if, if, uh, if food safety risks are introduced, but it's also important for food waste as well. Um, a lot of food that is wasted is, is nutritious food. And trade is another very important factor in, in the nutrition of food environment. Then we think about food processing and how we can intervene there, whether it's utilization or reformulation or changing the targets and incentives for the industry themselves. Then we go back into agricultural production to say what we can do there. And then into the <coughs> into agricultural production. 
Can we begin to build up a coherent system which is geared towards nutritious, healthy diets, which are good for people, um, which are going to support the good health of people at risk of any form of malnutrition. And uh, so this is the coherence we need with also the economics of the system, and I haven't mentioned that, but also the environment and sustainability. So this is really a, a people-centered method of identifying what is going to, there's lots of options there, but what is going to be the option which is going to match need in any particular context. And um, so this is what we call um, a people-centered So in my last slide, I'm really calling for policy changes. In the work that um, I do and we do at the centre and indeed at the Global Nutrition Report, we are often talking to health ministries here in the UK but around the world. And what always strikes me about people who work in health services is just how dedicated they are. Regardless of their political masters and their viewpoints, they are always very, very dedicated to improving health and nutrition. And I think they deserve our support from this broader food system perspective. So their life trying to improve nutrition is not made more difficult by a food system which is not working in their direction. And this is why I think we all have to think carefully about what we can learn from other countries. Because this global food system is global. The food system is connected between countries. And when you start to look between countries, you see commonalities. The manifestation may be different, but what I've tried to show is that there are commonalities and there are ways to, uh, to learn from different countries. And what's really powerful is when you start to learn lessons about what you do. And um, many times we can say, what, what do we do about this? And we can look at the, what different countries are doing, and I've tried to show some of that uh, in order to learn what can be most effective. So my plea is for a global view and a coherent view, so we can have a free system that works for people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, uh, very interesting. The, um, we're we're going to have a small sort of panel discussion here for us, and then I'm going to throw it open to the floor, um, and I'm going to usurp the chair's position of being the first to comment. Um, um, I mean, I, I, I find it, it's very interesting, that especially that last slide, the call for policy coherence. I mean, I've just told you my experiences in the developing world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. And it was quite interesting, uh, uh, last year I was in Rwanda, where, um, when I was there, we were actually with the Ministry of Agriculture, and um, they suddenly had figures from the UN saying that they had 36% stunting in Rwanda. And the president had got absolutely furious about this and had called the ministers and the permanent secretaries of agriculture, education, and health and said, This is ridiculous. We have huge amounts of food, masses of vegetables and fruits in our country to grow. What is going on here? And it turned out that what was going on was that and it was just cultural tradition. That after you finished breastfeeding your babies, you, um, you fed them sort of watered-down maize and then maize milk, which of course has absolutely nothing else at all. And uh, what they were going to do, the solution they were going to do, they were going to call from the, they were going to get every village to choose their mother superior, or their superior mother, I, they, they were going to vote the person who they wanted, who was going to go to um, Kigali and get trained in nutrition and go back and train all the mothers in their village to try to, to solve it. And, and the point about this story is that, is that it, I mean, something is the most appalling thing. And it's not only obviously physical stunting. I'm sure I'm teaching my grammar to start against it, but stunting is it you know results in cognitive degeneration, which affects the child for the rest of their lives. And it's a really serious thing. And of course, they were really ashamed of that. Um, and the president took political action from the very top. Now, yeah, going the other end of the scale, the decent thing is also like that. Um, there isn't any real sh sort of shame as yet in the countries of for a bad obesity, which is why, as you were saying, the stunting figures are beginning to get better in some countries, but the obesity is not really being looked at. And, 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 and my point really is that, that in order to deal with this, you do need political focus, concentrated political focus, from the very top. That's certainly in developing countries. And I'm actually sure it's also applies in the, in the, um, in the 
So I don't know whether any of our other panelists would like to come in. Yeah, I've also been in Rwanda and yeah. for a few years, so I've oh, right. actually went coming from yeah. the tops, all their tops are down the hills as well, which is yeah. never easy, it's obviously because yeah. there's a statue all down the hill. Um, I think we're well, going to come from it very much from an obesity point of view, we've thrown the uh, all party group on obesity, which is about to kick start again, we're going to have to be um, a few weeks away from the parliament. But also, as a member of the Select Committee, we, um, we produced a report that's called uh, Passing the Government Tech for Women's Road Action on the BBC. And I, I was quite pleased that we did highlight that obesity is one form of malnutrition. It's people who say it's not what you eat, it's who are what you eat. I think we've really seen that from what we were saying, that it's actually you know, uh, people who are obese are obviously in the wrong position. And I think that that's really illustrated by the fact that you get higher levels of, of obesity in the most uh, deprived communities in the UK. And I think it's really, when you hear, see the stats that uh, at the moment when a child starts in school, uh, one in five of them are likely to be overweight or obese. And by the time they leave from primary school to go to secondary school, one in three are likely overweight or obese. And I think the data is that by uh, 2020, 60% of boys in the most deprived areas will be overweight or obese, uh, compared to in fact 16% of boys from the from uh, areas that aren't deprived. So this big divide between deprived areas and the, the better off areas, um, which I find is really clear. It's something we need to. It's, if you start to address the health inequalities, you start to address the issues and to capture everything being joined up. And then it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about nutrition, it's also about the long-term impact of that on, on health. I've found out recently that um, type 2 diabetes is being diagnosed in teenagers and that was always seen previously as a disease older age and with that it brings uh, cardiovascular disease, it brings renal disease, sight loss, uh, it brings high risk of cancers. So the long term implications of not getting it right in childhood and getting the nutrition right is really very worrying. I think there's and when the um, uh, child abuse strategy or the plan came out and I actually was very disappointed even though I'm a certain member of Parliament because I'm very critical of the government, so I thought they had that opportunity to go further. So the Health Committee, the Select Committee, that should say to be bold and brave, and they weren't. I feel that they, talking to the, um, the Health Minister, seems to have other things that you know, you're having discussions as well. I think it's a of trying to do things one second at a time so people weren't overwhelmed. I think there's lots of other measures that can be taken, the, the advertising. One thing that the House Select Committee recommended to actually is uh, prevent advertising drink food in our know, hot water chairs and we're still talking for that. The moment it's actually banned on children's TV, but before the fact that watch uh, the Saturday TV, uh, evening programs and see all sorts of unhealthy products flash up, and it's got to influence. And it's so hard for parents to actually say no when it's actually being advertised on TV. So I think obviously I think it's really important. It's really good that we seem to be all talking um, and saying that which is really important. Um, I'm sure there'll be more things that come out later, but that's sort of really, really where I'm coming from. I think we are really talking about the same issues and what can we do in the same direction. Yes, um, I was asked to prepare a five minute speech, so I don't know if people are willing to listen to that or would want me just to pass a comment. Very Professor Hawkes, the excellent introduction, it was great. And I think anyone listening to those statistics on malnutrition can see that this isn't a matter of absolute urgency. I've worked closely with the Food Foundation since we were established two years ago in Happy Birthday, by the way. Sorry, I couldn't make it to your party. Um, 
I've also been one of the founders of the All Party Inquiry into Hunger in the UK. I'm currently a trustee of Feeding Britain and I'm a former member of the EFRA Select Committee where we did an inquiry into food sustainability. So I think it's safe to say that this is an issue that I'm very much involved in in Parliament and I will continue to always be involved in it because I don't believe anybody anywhere should ever have to face the indignity of wondering where their next meal is going to come from. And whilst I understand completely that this is a global issue and it hits right at the heart of our world, I would like to focus a few of my brief comments, if that's okay, on some domestic issues. Um, anyone at all who is tuned in to what happens outside the walls of this palace knows full well the scale of hunger and poverty in our country. So it's been a constant source of frustration for me that despite my efforts and the efforts of others, that government will not acknowledge that there is a problem here in the United Kingdom. They refuse to measure food inequality or food poverty, poverty, let alone formulate policy solutions. In fact, it's my view, and it has always been my view, that they have actively at times pursued policies that make hunger an inevitability for so many, especially through the systematic erosion of our welfare safety net. The government, though, keep telling me that they are measuring food inequality, citing the Living Costs Food Survey, but we know that that isn't an adequate measure at all. In a recent debate, I called again on the government to close the data gap. I asked them to insert a short list of questions in an annual existence survey instrument, such as the Living Costs and Food Survey, or any of the national health surveys that we have. Now, the marginal cost of doing this is actually between £50,000 and £75,000. So that's less than the basic wage of most members of parliament in this place. Small sums in treasury terms to address one of the biggest scandals of our time. But government resistance still remains. Because the truth is that if you collect the data, then you know the true scale of the problem, then you have to do something about it. But if you refuse to ignore what's happening and not collect that data, then you can keep pretending that the problem just doesn't exist. This approach is consistent with the tax that I've seen on the Trussell Trust. When they've released numbers of hungry in the UK, I've seen secretaries of state and ministers repeatedly come to the dispatch box to try and discredit this research and say that the numbers are misleading. How long can they pursue this de deceitful strategy? The UNICEF report published just last month found that the UK has some of the highest levels of hunger and deprivation out of the world's richest nations. Moderate or severe food insecurity was found to affect nearly 20% of children under the age of 15 in the United Kingdom. This makes us significantly higher than the average for all other developed countries. Now I'm absolutely delighted that my party has listened and has taken this issue seriously. Our manifesto put some really bold policies in place, including a major public health strategy to improve the health and well-being of every single child in this country. We want to combat health inequalities and end the scandalous link between deprivation and child health. We want to introduce a child health bill, setting in law our ambition for the UK's children to be the healthiest in the world. And legally requiring all government departments to have a child health strategy to set out how they want to support this ambition. We would also enshrine the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into domestic law. We'd introduce a new child health index jointly between the Department for Health and Public Health England to measure progress against international standards and report annually against four key indicators being obesity, dental health, hunger virus and mental health. At the moment, there's no standardised data collection on child health indicators with international comparisons. So in order to measure progress, we would also establish one. Sadly, we have to be in government for that to happen, and we aren't. So in opposition, I am going to continue to push the government on a measurement. I'll continue to work with the Food Foundation and others to try and get a 10 minute rule bill off the ground. And I will never give up until I start seeing some real results 
and eradicate some of the scourge of poverty that's in our country. I refuse to accept and always will that food poverty and inequality is a normal part of our society. In the meantime, I just want to say thank you to some of you in this room because you are doing a lot to help the hungry fill in that gate and hole that's left by the state. The weight of evidence now and public opinion is on our side. When an empowered opposition against an enfeebled government, we have an opportunity now to force the government's hand and try and address this problem once and for all. I hope those of you who I've already worked with will continue to help me do that, and those I haven't, I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll speak as loud as I possibly can. Uh, just to start off, I'm not an expert in this field, but I was born in 1951 in inner city Liverpool. And my community had children that were going short of food and their malnutrition in my little community. So I've seen it first uh, hand how damaging that is to young children. Because those children have to go to school, have to not be fed properly, can't concentrate. And their life's chances are ruined because they're not able to get the nutritious meal that they need and require. But I, I think that some of the things that have happened, I think it's difficult to talk about malnutrition and then talk about the third world because I've, I've just had to concentrate on, on the UK because I think what's happened is there's been a number of things changed since I was in school. For example, when I went to school, children got school meals. And when they got school meals, it was a balanced meal. It wasn't junk food. It was, it was intended to be a healthy meal for children to go to school on and to, uh, and to eat. What we saw was that diminished over the years so that children stopped eating a healthier diet and they were helping themselves to burgers, chips, or whatever kids like to eat. And I think we've got to understand that why did people like sugar? Why do you like fats? Well, they like it because they're programmed to it. As a human being, you're programmed to like those sorts of things. Because in, in, in past lives, you didn't actually have to worry about some of those things. You never got, you never got over consumption. You never had the opportunity. You ran, if you exercise, you're chasing food, but you actually need some of those things to actually achieve what you need to achieve in life. But that's changed, and we need to change. We look at how we eat food and the sorts of diets. Now, TV advertisements being talked about here, uh, and I think that we've got a long way to go on that. I think we've got we will certainly start to control the sorts of flow of information that we see. And I think we've got to take stronger action against the food manufacturers who often put some of the sugars and salt into the product because they know the consumers like it and they actually uh, are doing it deliberately even though they know that's not good for public health. So I think greater control and regulation for our food is crucially important as well. I also think that we need to consider some of the other implications of why. I mean, I, I, obesity in this country is caused by the lack of access in some of the different respects. Many of our community haven't got access to fresh vegetables. If they haven't got a car and they live on a council estate that's miles away from a car, then it's unlikely that we'll get those sorts of fresh vegetables that we need. Often children now don't even know where the vegetables come from. I used to, when I was a leader of the council, I used to talk to children, I used to take them to allotment sites, which they very much enjoyed. But they often didn't know that's how food was actually generated. They thought it was like to the market and shop and they've got. So I think there's an education job. I would like to see, I think, as a strategy, I'd like to see people concentrate on children. I'd like to see us change attitudes to children. For example, one of the things when I was at school that kids had to do was what they called the domestic science. It was about actually how to prepare good quality food. Now, you don't, a lot of the things that don't happen in school now, there's a lot of action that we could take in school to actually make kids better prepared for the world that we face. And obesity, quite frankly, is one of those areas that we've got less active. Children are doing lots, a lot less activity, and I've got three grandchildren, and I know that they would rather play on their iPads than they would do go and play football. But I think we've got to do a lot more to get 
is engage in sports and activities to actually give them exercise. Because quite frankly, to become abused, you need to figure out how much you're putting into your system and with that how much you're generating and exercise out. And there's no way about it. But I think there's an awful long way to go with the way that we actually bring up children. When I went to Brazil, and uh, I'm chairman of the Brazilian group, I was actually quite impressed that despite all the problems that Brazil had, they were doing some interesting stuff. They had, for example, free school meals for kids. They also had restaurants in the poorest community. When I say restaurants, there were restaurants that were set up in, in the poorest communities, and they offered high-quality food to the local community. So the community could access that food. I think there's quite a... We can learn a lot from Brazil and other countries about how we get back to getting our people, especially our children, to have a healthy, uh, healthy meal and how, how they live a healthy life. And unless we actually go back, in some cases, to some of the things that we did many years ago, we can't make the security Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to come in the stage or do you want to say your yeah. thing for later? I'll just make a couple of yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, points. Yeah. Um, I think it's been a really fascinating. Um, I'm going to speak up. I apologise for the noise, everybody. Um, we work all night here. <laughs> um, I think it's been a really fascinating set of comments that we've been hearing reflections from all around the world, really around this unifying problem that Claude has framed around poor diets and how we start to think about poor diets differently. Um, and also about the different outcomes which we talk about differently and don't necessarily link to that same problem. So um, we've talked about the 10% you know, of children in Britain who live in severely food insecure households. And we talked about the 10% of children in Scotland who are obese, more of them are overweight, which is fair. Um, and everybody we've talked about inequality and the fact that these two problems together around the problem of inequality and the fact that when you combine a low income with a, a food environment which um, is characterised by cheaper um, food being the most um, attractive um, and cheap, um, you get a really bad outcome for children sometimes. It's really, it means that you have, you have a combination where you do have households that are at the same time and they're facing periods where they're struggling to put food on the table and their children might be overweight or obese and that's all happening at once and this is a really dangerous environment for children to be growing up in who's going to spend long term future and I think that's the challenge we face and I think what Corinne has laid out is a vision really for how we can think about the food system differently and um, I think it's just worth mentioning very briefly that we have an opportunity coming up with the new agriculture bill of a, you know, in the Freedom of Speech, that we will be making new legislation in this parliament to actually think about for Britain what kind of food production system we want and how we want to incentivize that, to use Corona's language, to make a stronger connection between what we grow and produce in Britain and our diet. And at the moment, the narrative is very strongly around um, you know, the benefits of um, you know, thinking about agriculture. Hugely important, we don't want to lose that focus, but we need to also be thinking about its impact on growth. How we think about the future of farming in Britain, three billion pounds that farmers, for example, currently get from the common agricultural policy, but thinking about that broad scale, how do we use that in a way which actually starts to make a stronger connection between what we grow and what we eat, between the incentivizing the best foods, the highest quality foods, the most nutritious foods. Um, through the system. So I think we have an immediate opportunity on the table in this parliament to think about this in the very way that Corinna is proposing we do in terms of thinking about the agriculture future being the big picture and how we can look at the, the policies around agriculture in Britain to deliver better outcomes. Um, and then Maggie mentioned advertising, um, which I think is obviously sort of almost unfinished business really, and on the table as being the sort of Key thing that didn't get into childhood obesity strategy, which there's really the moral argument has been won for, um, in the sense that we already have regulations for children's viewing time, so 
we've acknowledged that this is a problem for children who let do the job properly. Um, and I think that's been an immediate opportunity there to continue to press that point um, and, and to try and win that argument in, in policy terms. And one final point, I, I think the, we've heard about um, the problem of poor dykes from multiple settings and there's significant that one in three people in the world has some form of malnutrition. And I think that creates a huge opportunity for the UK to think about its diet systems alongside a whole raft of other systems that are battling with a similar set of problems and a similar set of drivers. That problem might look a little bit different in different settings, but we actually we're all in this together. Country, poor country thing. This is a we have a global food system that's not delivering for us, and we need to change it. How do we do that? And how do we make sure that the UK is really alongside other countries in the world, thinking about this problem, leading the way, and thinking about how we frame the food system globally, which is the best for us all? And I think we should be laying that challenge down to the government as we go forward. Good. Thank you very much. Sharon. Okay, um, we've got. Five minutes uh, before we, an hour on the stage again. It would be a good idea to have some comments or brief questions on the floor. 30 seconds each. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take two or three of them at once. Anyone want to say anything? Anyone, anyone got a question for anyone on the panel? Yes, maybe about that. Um, speak up to the building. Yeah. Anybody else got a question they want to ask or a point? That gentleman on the back there. Because you, you could stand up, it might be better for you. Sorry, it's, we're, we're all the windows open. I kind of. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else want to come? Yeah, gentlemen here in the front. Yeah. My name is Alan Smith. I work uh, for an NGO called the Walk of Water for the Future. I'm part of the Conference for our last conference. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's, it really is food systems lens is really, really important. I work for some of the biggest um, food businesses on, in the world, and they really need a strong system of kind of framework for policy that's <laughs> it's not just about what we eat, but how, how we grow what we eat. And um, I see this time and time again. They need, they need regulation, I think, a lot more. And we've had a huge amount of failure not being able to do that. <laughs> like, give them chocolate, but to the checkout and the market to grow. That really needs to be a lot longer. So, the question is how, what's preventing these folders in other Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, that, I think that's all the questions we've got time for this time. Big another big gap. So, could we go to answer those three points or, or any of the points? Or,
I mean, this issue about the balance between regulation versus nudge, I think it's a, a false a false division, really, and I mean, it's, it is a division. But it, it, the answer is it, it depends on, on what, what, the, what the issue is, what, what works, what we need to be focused on is what works, what is actually effective. And so what we need is to set very clear limits when it comes to the behaviour of the industry. But what is acceptable not, and what is not acceptable. And if they are doing any kind of advertising that is promoting foods which should be consumed in moderation, that simply should be unacceptable in our society. That's it. And so as businesses, they then learn how to live with it. As a rubbish business, we are a business. But if they're good businesses, um, they will be incentivized to behave differently. Uh, in other areas, um, there, are, there, are, there are times when um, small changes about conditioning and so on can be effective. So I think the answer is, it depends what you want to achieve and what works most effectively. But you need to have both, and you need to have accommodation. <coughs> That's why I'm very focused on starting with people and understanding how they react to these changes. What is really need to change those environments in a, in a comprehensive way. And I think that's what um, Challenge Work suggests, because what Challenge Work shows is that it's a combination of one's own personal circumstances and household circumstances, which is socially and, and determined by policy and other things about how much money you have, and it's the interaction between how much money you have and all the rest of it, and the food environment. And so you need to tackle both uh, welfare issues and, and the food environment. And um, we'll know the balance of those by understanding um, the reality that the people are doing. I just want to say, I think policy is something that is crucially important, and I, I agree a whole lot. The idea that families have to go to food banks demonstrates they haven't got enough money to actually buy their families good quality food. That's a national scandal in the country <coughs> that's so much as this one. The first thing, the second thing is we've had 30 years of deregulation of politicians from all sides believe in regulation is the wrong thing to do. Quite frankly, I remember having a <coughs> debate in, in Western of the Fall about 15 years ago when everyone wanted to deregulate everything. And then I was trying to make the point that if we didn't have regulation, we wouldn't be able to drink the water because it would be the right quality. And there's plenty of reasons why we have regulation. You know, regulation is not needed, but we do need good regulation. And it should set some of these great on salt, sugar, and all those, and we've got to remember, it's got to be regulation, because otherwise one producer is facing competition from another producer who will produce something that is not unhealthy if they think there's a market for it. So I, I think it has to be regulated, and I think we've tried the voluntary and it's not perfect, and I think more regulation is the way forward. Maggie? I want to answer the first two questions in a combined way. I think there's a fine balance between the nanny state, between business cooperation, between parental and personal responsibility. And I'm sure it's not impossible to find that ground. And we've actually seen from the industry side moving in regards to salt. So I can't see why I can't give them grass to sugar. But I think it's, the problem is so great, we perhaps need to be more forceful with it. But I think my problem is that when the, it's more common to grab a takeaway or a microwave meal than it is to actually cook a chicken and, as I do, use a palm to make soup to right the bitter end, then I think we've got a problem because it takes away people's choice when the environment is that takeaway environment and that becomes the norm. So I think we really need to look at and just really to the accessibility uh, and if, if the accessibility to the food is to process food, then that's what we need to start to regulate. And to the last question, I have been known to say to the checkout person in WH Smith, if I wanted a bar of chocolate with my newspaper, I'd buy a bar of chocolate with my newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. The, the lady, sorry, I didn't catch your name. And um, one of the other things that I've campaigned for as well is for a joint up departmental approach to these issues, which is what I think you touched on, because a lot of the time, the different departments don't talk to each other, so they don't know how they're impacting. And really, when it comes to issues around food and sustainability, they need, they need to all be talking to each other. And just on the regulation versus the nudge issue, I think um, with Brexit coming up, we need to be very careful that we do keep the regulation we already have. Because if you're an unscrupulous business and regulation comes with costs, 
in a neighbouring country close by doesn't have that regulation, then we will just move. So we don't want to lose businesses, but at the same time, we want to make sure that that regulation is across the board and that there's some kind of understanding between neighbouring countries about that. Thank you very much. Okay, Anna, you're going to talk about the launch of some of the briefs you've got. Yes, very briefly, yeah. briefly about the briefs. Um, when, so today, I mean, this, uh, as you'll have gathered from the, the speakers that we've had in the conversation we've had so far, um, we see there being a real opportunity to um, learn from other countries um, here in the UK as to how we deal with this challenge of all forms of malnutrition. And um, so we're launching a series today, um, which is all about that. Um, it's about trying to um, communicate clearly to other countries some of the areas of policy which we know other countries are looking to us to find out more about. And it's about trying to bring in good experiences from other countries into the UK, um, where we know that policymakers are interested in, in what those, those countries have done. So we're launching today the first five briefings Series. Um, the first one is really an overarching one. Joe Watson just said something about how it's fun, and it's um, it really frames the sort of global challenge of all forms of malnutrition in the UK uh, and beyond. And they all they're all available. They're all available online. We haven't put them in the you know tree, but, we, but they're all online, and we'll be sending you the links um, uh, to either this evening or tomorrow morning. Um, and then we have um, two which are really um, prompted by um, discussions with Thomas Brazil, um, which are around the UK sugar levy and the UK's um, advertising restrictions on junk food, limited as they are. We do have some, and many countries don't have any. Um, so um, these really tell the story. These have been written by Robin in the Food Foundation team from Hinks. Um, they really tell the story of how these pieces of legislation have come what was important in terms of building that public opinion, kind of parliamentary support, and what the legislation actually looks like, and where it falls short, where there are loopholes, where what the evaluations have shown around its impact. So those two are focused on the UK, and then the second two are focused on Brazil. And the reason we focused on Brazil was really because we we all know that Brazil has been really a champion for tackling hunger and food insecurity in particular, but in rights agenda. And this we developed these through collaboration with the Institute of Development Studies. Benny Humphrey who is sitting there was the author. And they're amazing. They're a treasure trove of um, really interesting policy interventions that the Brazilians have done. And they're particularly for them the last policy which really goes through in very succinct terms a whole series of different types of tier two restaurants which George Watts mentioned, um, human milk plants, um, programs to tackle holiday hunger, really interesting the links between public procurement and school meals and linking it to small farmers. We'll hear probably a little bit more about that from my office. Um, but um, it's it's a story and we, we, our intention is to build on this series. We're going to think about um, connections with India next and bring in some more examples from there. So you can watch this space and we hope that there'll be a useful contribution to sort of policy thinking. Um, around uh, food here in the UK. Um, I think that's probably enough because we're going to hear much more interesting stuff about Brazil's because we're here for a while. Quite a responsibility, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we ask uh, Professor Renato um, uh, Malu, that's right, sorry, um, to, to talk to us about a little bit about what's going on in Brazil. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody. You probably have to speak up quite loud. I'm sorry. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, organizer, for this opportunity of sharing with you some reflections on the Brazilian experience. It's quite a responsibility that after hearing you about my country, but I'll try to, in five minutes, to give you some highlights <coughs> of the experience. I've been asked to pick up some lessons learned on the Brazilian experience. First of all, most of what you will hear in here is the result of a social process or a process of social construction, construction that's been developed in, in on for some 20 years now. 
and this is an outcome of the book, because all this started in the end of the military book. So democracy is a key element in the political space. Uh, it's important to insist that in this. I mean, you don't miss democracy here in your country. Perhaps you can do a little bit better. <laughs> we can do, we can all do a little bit better. But uh, this is quite important because the Brazilian experience has been transferred to many countries. And <coughs> as the democratic debate, the open debate around the issue, giving visibility to contradictions different bills, and depending on where you are, trying to reach an agreement around the local policy is an essential element, and this is not transferable. So sometimes this is the missing part of the policy transfer. Second is building this sort of intersectorial and participatory approach. The participatory means that all this construction is, has been done with a strong participation of civil society organizations in different ways. I myself, as I mentioned, I was part of the network and also a member of the public council and public policy. So this is one pillar of the regional experience, which has to do with social participation in the very making of policies and implement and also the monitoring and control which are not possible. The other pillar is having this intersectorial spaces of talking about the government. So the council has 40 members from civil society and 20 ministers from different sectors. These 20 ministers ministers they got together in the interministerial chamber to deal with food and nutrition security. And then this is a governmental space where they take or not powerful positions. But the most important aspect of it, of it is this trying to have this intersectorial dialogue. You certainly realize that this is not the story of the strong and powerful Brazilian Army business. I'm not talking about that. Another story. They are part of the course. That we discussing of the system. Yeah. They, are, they are just the other reserve. We've got lots of reserves. So I'm talking about one part of it, which is the one I, I think I do wrong. And I tried to. The second is that this idea of having multi, a multi dimensional view on food and poverty means that there is no silver bullet. In this topic. And this is perhaps is one of the most important lessons learned in the experience, is that making use of a bunch of products. Although you can identify one or two that could be the, the for instance the cash transfer program, etc. But if we if we didn't have, especially during the new war, a strong counter cyclical policy in the middle of the crisis creating jobs and recovering the real value of the minimum wage, we will we will succeed as we did in the poverty and, and hunger. The other is has to do with, with the institutional framework. We in our experience it's been quite important translating at least the main parts of it in terms of law. In Brazil, I mean, as in, most, in many countries of the world, I mean, it, it, it's not enough having the law. You can have the law, but just not pay attention. Yeah. But uh, it's been important because it, for the first time we have a definition of the nutrition security and the, the law, the, the, the right to food in the Constitution, etc. And this helps in pushing the, 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 the getting some compromise from government and also from the society. The other aspect is has to do with the launching of some innovative programs. One of one of these innovations that are my uh, that are most mentioned has to do with this idea, which is quite intersectorial. Perhaps it's the most important intersectorial product 
that we queried in 2003, which made mainly the access to, to food from, from poor families and creating market for small producers and food producers. This idea of using the food procurement to promote at the same time access and production kind of no matter which production, the production planning from family farmers or small, small farmers. This was the very beginning of this integrated field. But in this case, there was an important aspect that at that time it, it was necessary to have a program that <coughs> was against the law, in which sense. Because, as probably in many parts of the world, food procurement and the, the use of food research, of public research, is based in a false assumption that you have to treat all equally. When you treat <coughs> equally, when you treat unequals equally, what you're doing is promoting an inequality. And I came from one of the most unequal countries in the world. So this program that I just mentioned, and everybody takes it as a normal success, etc. At that time, at that moment, it, it's, it, it, it meant that we have to, to disobey the law in order to say this public resource will be used for this purpose. So we are going to, the government will take the money that he used to catch it, he used to use for buying food. And we shall normally capture by large companies and say, no, there is in this public offer here, is a, a, we are going to recognize the public offer in a way that we will prioritize this sector. And this is against the idea of treating <coughs> equally everybody. Now, he's treating unequally the unequals in order to promote a little bit more of equality. And this idea was was uh, uh, used in the reframing of the school new program that we already mentioned. The school new program result is the, the, the oldest one we have. It, it's got about 50 years now. But for 20 years, it became a program with its own budget. budget. And it's been reformulated in 2009 with a strong social participation in it and then this idea of buying local food, in this case for school, it, it gains a, a, a nationwide uh, uh, presence because the program is, the, the, the school meal program, it, it's present in 5,500 municipalities. And it's a free school. I think it's the biggest, the largest free school meal program in the world. It's 46 million meals a day. And for, I think I've got already, I wish already the, the five minutes. Just make me, just let me make a, a, a last point of our experience. I've been talking about social participation. One important aspect is that for, for giving some effectiveness to the social participation, it's very important. The civil society is able to, uh, the, to have some autonomy and have some autonomous organization in order to be better prepared to influence those policies. So this idea of having the network of civil society and having and combining the, the ways of dialogue with government. We are in our in the case of the council, our mission is promoting the dialogue between government and civil society by giving visibility to different fields, from tradition and conflict, and trying to reach an agreement. But this is not all the civil society do. <coughs> the social movements, especially, they do pressure. They go to streets. So the idea is combining the way. We can have very nice people in the government, but I have an author that I like most, that says that the best situation is having good people Involvement surrounded by good pressure. And that's the way the integrated view is concerned. Thank you very much.
have to go there. I was to another meeting. I took it off five minutes ago. But I'm really glad that I didn't get it. I don't want to say it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the chaos begins. Um, so let's be taking in batches of four. And if you've got a specific question to a panel member, or you want to comment to a panel member, if you can just make the point clear when you are. The gentleman of the pink shirt. The light pink The light pink shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is George Foster. I'm uh, chair of the support group for the APPG. Uh, I just don't want to make a point. It's not about policy. I hope we might be able to get energy and food um, at the research and development. I can put, for example, things other than tables you talked about, dietary diversification. I used to look after an institute called the International Rice Research Institute, which we started the Green Revolution, all about staples. And of course, 50% of all the world's food comes from rice, wheat, maize, soybean. In terms of the investment that's been vast in r and has meant that those commodities are a lot cheaper. You can buy them, you can store them, and so on. The investment in all of the other, what we would call the fiber day in the developing world as well as the developing world, is minuscule compared to that. And that's reflected partly in the price, which means that with over 60% of people living in cities, yes, people in rural areas can afford it, but in cities, it becomes very difficult to buy it. So I would just urge you not to lose sight of the need to find out policy. We also need to continue investment in R&D, the things we're producing, seed supplies and so on. It's fallen behind. And DEFRA has savagely axed its research into R&D for British agriculture. Yeah. Gentlemen there, and I've got two ladies at the back there. Uh, my name is Peter Graves. I'm a nutritionist who worked 10 years ago for MAF and then FAO and UNICEF. I want to make two points. Huh? First, I was going to congratulate our chairman this listen to phrase from soil to stomach. I thought that was extremely neat. And of course, soil is the essence. And it is a very serious matter, the extent to which we are using soils around the world, and let us say, especially in the UK. And if we look at box one of this document, sustainable food system, sustainable agriculture, water, land, air, no nature of soil, and if you look down in box two, defining sustainable agriculture, it is pretty sort of wishy-washy. It hasn't got the precision, which I would like to see, and I know I haven't time, but I'll just say briefly what that is. Conservation agriculture in its support, I think, of no-till, soil cover, diversity, which is taken all around the world, and especially in Brazil. There's enormous success. Little in this country again. The second point I want to make relates to obesity. It is no accident that we have uh, this terrible problem of obesity in China. And also we have about the lowest best eating rate in the world. And there's hardly any reference to best eating, as I can see. What is mentioned, and it is, it is, I, it's astonishing, if not scandalous, sir, that last year the childhood obesity plan developed by this government makes no mention of this at all. 
weeks with me while in Mary and Hillary. Professor of Popular Psychology at Leeds University. In an interview, he said he'd like to change food policy. I'd encourage mothers to pay. Okay, thank you. There's two women at the back. The will take the one in the green place, and then the one that we can't see with the lady that way there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll take the lady in the green first, in the green, green black dress. Uh, my name is Francis Hanscoms. Uh, my wife and international in the UK. I've worked in Brazil. I've had a for Professor Renato. Um, Lula as president was a very key piece of the governance uh, arrangements that he talked about. Um, from before his presidency, he was very interested in nutrition and hunger. Um, he combined those forcefully with poverty reduction and social protection. And I think he was a driving force for a lot of the policies that he talked about. Um, so I wonder, can it be replicated without a ruler? So can it, for example, be replicated without so that lady there, and I'll, 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 i will 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 i
think it's hard to argue against Messi because all the evidence is there. And in fairness, there have been some public campaigns that tried to do that, but not very successful. But it, it might be worth doing some research to why it's so unsuccessful in the UK compared to other countries. Uh, Can I just pick up I yeah. think a couple of the questions bit about the uh, so scientist before became a politician, then obviously R and D is really important and I understand that, so we need to push to make sure we've got the right resources there. And I think it obviously we need to target it to where we can improve productivity because that's going to obviously, as we mentioned about you know, high prices, it's going to help to bring down down the prices, but obviously tag this on to the yeah, any agricultural policy that we have that as a result of Brexit so we can actually really control how we yeah how we can our farmers to farm productively rather than just to have the land there. I think it's so important we make the most of that opportunity. Thank you. Structures uh, someone raised the issue about whether you could just do that here or whether it had to be a global structure or how to do that. Was there not field qualified to say anything about that? I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll touch on, on that on that question. I mean, absolutely, it, it, it can, in, in some sense, it should be place based because um, every place, every context um, has some very there's, there's commonalities between places, but every context is a context, and every place has a context. So, to identify where those solutions are in a particular context means starting with particular places, particular communities. And so you have this combination of global level policy, hard government regulation, um, and then bottom up approaches that come either from different countries or come from these, these place based approaches. So, um, in any situation, if you're wanting, uh, following Ronaldo's point about making this more farmers, um, if you're in a place, you can make those relationships with farmers more easily, which is going to be much more difficult in a, in a, in a, larger, in a larger market. So, I think there are different opportunities available in different places. But what's really important about place and spatial based process is, is where people are getting their food from, the retailing environment. What does it look like? Is it takeaway? Is, is it bare of anything, which it is in some places? Um, is it uh, stocks from the, from the food that's incredibly expensive? You know, or is it just the, the big supermarket down the road? And actually, what do people want out of their retail? What, where, you know, what, what, what is actually going to work for them? And I think that's what place spatial can really start with. I just also wanted to touch on the point about diversity in, in agricultural research, that 45% uh, of all private sector research is spent on one crop, which is corn, and that's private sector research, which is very significant in, in addition to public sector research. But public sector investment is a policy. It is a decision about the allocation of resources. And so governments can make different policy decisions about where they allocate resources. But it's, uh, and the evidence that's coming out now is that globally, um, most nutrients come from diverse landscapes. There's very good research on that now. And that small farmers tend to be more diverse. So you can follow on the logic from that. So it's not just the research into, <coughs> into the products, but it's about who's producing it, what kind of landscapes is producing it, and then what kind of markets is it going, going into to make sure it's reaching people who need it. In other words, you need to look at agriculture, but in the context of the country. I'll take the next batch. I'm at the, the patient minister first. Well, thank you, my name is Tim Potts. I'm the Bishop of Truro, I co chair of the Feeding Rating Inquiry. So, my good notes on the rise. Very taken with Professor Malou's um, contribution, and he very generously uh, suggested the beginning that we live in democracy here in this country. Um, I just wonder whether the uh, British politicians on the panel might like to say that as part of our campaign, should we not look for a how do you minister on food? Okay. Then we'll let you watch it. Um, so uh, I might have thrown out the room for this, but I spent 20 years in the marketing and advertising of major food with the biggest, ugliest people you can think of as my clients, uh, working in, in Europe and Africa and, and in America. And you want the data. We all will bring up the data. I mean, this is, that industry studies the psychology, the home environment, down to every every group in our community is under the very, very poorest kind of order of food shop. We understand exactly how they think, their culture, the emotions, the psychology around food is really important to our community. As a, as a sector, we talk about how do we, how do we persuade families to be loyal to our occasional treats. 
but that's what they're really getting treat doing is that they're using the brainwashing techniques for, towards kids to get them to be addicted to products they know to be harmful. And you know, the language sounds very dramatic, but you tell me which of those words you would disagree with. Um, three or four years ago, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, which you might be divine justice. Um, <laughs> I, I had an epiphany uh, and I closed down my business and I have since spent my life supporting charities, including the Medical Food Foundation and any other organization that is trying to address this problem. And I've spent many, many hours at meetings like this <coughs> and And what I see is a food industry that uses choice as its defense, right? And it uses deflection as its but it gets us talking about everything other than it. With the to you, but for us, we need one example of lack of playgrounds, and no burst, and no extreme time, getting the to make them, natural births, and everything else we can possibly talk about that doesn't equate to us stuffing our faces with too much poisonous food. What's really left me with a sense of feeling from the, the childhood obesity crisis is it's left me feeling as though, and this is my question to the politicians and the HRET, it's made me feel as though perhaps our government's engagement with fixing this. You know, in reality, the food industry pays 1.6 <laughs> billion pounds a year with the media in this country. We have food industry, there is no commercial media, so it controls the media. We have no public will to deal with the issue that actually has any price. And I am struggling to have any confidence that our political system is actually capable of addressing the greatest health risk that humanity faces. Thank you. I think just following on from that last comment, um, I'd be interested in people's views about where in the quirky solid, accurate, honest information. In Karina's um, presentation, when she was giving the, the sort of positives, she talked a little bit about the opportunity to have a good dialogue with the health professional. Well, the unfortunate thing in this country, certainly, is that the health professionals are not well informed when it comes to nutrition. I think nurses get about one hour on nutrition in their three years training, and GPs probably get about three to five hours. So there's a real problem there. Uh, by the way, my name is Pat Hughes. I work with C3 Collaboration for Health, and I'm currently doing some work with obese nurses. So 25% of my nurses in England are obese, much higher level than any other health professional group. Uh, thank you. My name is um, Jenny Thompson. I work with the Institute of Development Studies and I was fortunate now to work with the Food Foundation on how we're doing that result. <coughs> so I've found a way to have a conversation on breastfeeding and the policies that we can put in the health if, if that's an interesting gentleman. Um, my question to the politicians on the panel is thinking a bit um, closer to home. Scotland is doing some pretty interesting things at the moment, particularly with the Good Food Connection Bill and looking to learn from lots of other countries' experiences around things like agroecology, potentially the rights of food, uh, and, and I suppose food justice more broadly, looking at some of the issues that have been highlighted and thinking how governments could perhaps tackle some of them. How, how does that fit in Westminster? And is there, you know, what, how do we learn from how do you learn this from the nations within the UK? Anyone else? Before I come back to the panel, lady there. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Emily O'Brien. I work for the Brighton Coast Food Partnership. Uh, we take um, participants to quite a few of the food in one area. Um, thinking about lots of the stuff that's been talked about lately, things like breastfeeding and the food environment. Um, what does the food system like? What places?
Okay. Well, I suppose my question is, um, I'm thinking about um, kind of hot topic about the NHS at the moment and how much it's costing us and how that's increasing and the cost of public services. Do we know how this 23% of kids in our city who are going to struggle to eat properly next year? And as well as the people who have been much more severe to poverty, and these are heartbreaking stories, you know, we hear quite a lot of with our work with the kids. Do we know what that's going to cost the NHS in 20 years' time? And most people have had 20 years to digest or not digest that bad food, and we're in 50 years' time with their children now. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I, we'll start off with, do we need a cabinet minister uh, responsible for food? And the obesity and nutrition? Do anyone want that? I, I would just say that we need a national food policy. Yeah. Uh, so, a national food policy with a, a, a ministry attached. Oh, yeah. I, I think we need more, I think we've talked about this already, more joined up government. And I'd like to see health in all policies as well, which probably would come back to the last ladies here. We're actually looking at you know, what what has this one particular policy, what impacts it got on health, then I think that's been going a long, long way for that. And it's something that I keep, keep talking about. Um, I think sometimes in this place we talk a lot and uh, eventually we do get there. Um, sometimes it takes far too long. Uh, I think you. We have got DEFRA, we've got Secretary of State, and I would hope that he's shouting loud and clear about food. Because uh, that's it, you know, it is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, so it is in the remit. But of course, the ministers have different responsibilities as well, so there will be, an, I'm just trying to find out which minister it is for, for food, I probably the last, last invite on, yes. So, yeah, and he will really focus down on that. So he's the person to lobby, uh, George Eustace. And I think coming back to this gentleman here, um, yeah, it's, it's, I completely agree. I think uh, I was really bitterly disappointed, as I said earlier, about the, I won't even call it the, the, the strategy, because it wasn't a strategy at all. Uh, it was 13 pages, and it could have been a lot, lot stronger. Uh, if you talk to the industry people, they think they're hard done by by it, but actually I think we've got to look at the health of the nation, not just now, but long term. And, uh, and really, we should have got the opportunity, and every opportunity I get, and I think the Minister's sick of hearing me, I mean, today I was bothered up in the health questions because I saw an opportunity to get to go back to another question, and uh, didn't get called for that when I was called later on. And it's, yeah, I'm plugging away to it, both in the health select committee to my own policy group as well, that we need to be bolder and braver. I think the, you know, the messaging that's coming out through the, the, the plan is that if industry doesn't make the changes, then the changes will be made for them. And it comes back to, you know, do we want to live in another state? Do we actually want to? Companies to actually say, well, actually, you know, got you know, social responsibility is important. This is what they can do. So I think we need to come at it from all angles to have that impact. And uh, I think sometimes people think that MPs are all powerful, but we're not. It's not that easy. It's uh, a bit like the MPs are um, gradually moving the ship around and we get there. But we need people like yourself in this room to back us up to, to get our messages over. Without the information you're giving us, we don't have a message to give. That's a fundamental. Yeah, I agree. I fully agree with Gogina. The question is having a national plan, and if possible, depending on the institutional framework of each country, having a sort of interministerial chamber. Which is basically, in Brazil, at the beginning of the Lula government, they created a extraordinary ministry for food security and 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 we, from civil society, we were against. Because it's, instead of giving priority to the, to the topic, what the risk was sectorializing it. So, and that happened, I think. Six months, ago, the Minister of Health said, in one opportunity, uh, this issue of, of hunger is not with me. This is the Minister of yeah. sort of business. So, let's leave this to them, to him. And unfortunately, in one year, 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.